This is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, all talk and all crime. Inside the firing of FBI Director James Comey and then the murderous tale of a Texas nurse who became a serial killer. That's tonight on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Peter Elkind, one of the leading investigative journalists in the nation, old friend of our show. He co-wrote the definitive account of the Edron scandal, The Smartest Guys in the Room. He's been on our show for his book, Rough Justice. That's the inside story of Elliot Spitzer's scandal and his resignation as governor of New York. Longtime editor-at-large for Fortune magazine, including investigations into how Apple CEO Steve Jobs concealed his bout with cancer and how a cyber invasion brought Sony Pictures to its knees. Peter has just joined ProPublica as senior reporter. He will focus on coverage of the Trump administration and the president's businesses. It sounds like two full-time jobs to me. Tonight, we'll focus on Peter's inside look at the former FBI director Comey's story in an article He wrote the problems with the FBI email investigation went well beyond Comey. Previously unreported judgments and misjudgments by FBI agents played a crucial role in the FBI director's fateful decisions. This was an article that was written in collaboration between the New Yorker magazine and ProPublica. And then we're going to move on to the death shift, Nurse Janine Jones and the Texas Baby Murders. That was the subject of Peter's first book probably 30 years some ago, but it's sussed back in the news. Welcome, my friend. How are you? Good to be with you, Jim. Thank you. Tell us first off exactly what ProPublica is. Well, ProPublica is a nonprofit investigative reporting group, and it's very much needed these days because, as you know, traditional media have have been withering, suffered bad financial problems, and been cutting staff left and right. ProPublica is a nonprofit, and it's dependent on contributions, and it's been very successful in raising funds to do heavy-duty investigative work in the public interest. And it's attracted great and you, writers. You don't do fake. Uh, you, you don't do fake news, right? No, no fake news. No, no. <laughs> all right, we're going to jump inside the Comey um, uh, story. Uh, do you first of all do you see any link to uh, Nixon's famous Saturday Night Massacre in Watergate that was obviously considered illegitimate? Did you see anything of the same thing that Trump would have the gall to uh, to fire a guy looking into what he's doing? Well, I mean, the Saturday Night Massacre became kind of a cascade of, uh, you know, multiple people departing. Um, and this was just Comey to date. People are raising the, the specter that uh, if if Trump tries to fire Mueller, that, that you might see a repeat of that. Um, but, uh, you know, the issue is, you know, did, did was Trump getting rid of Comey in order to try to chill or discourage the Trump investigation. And, um, you know, while there was a pretext for it that he offered Mm -hmm. that uh, actually had some legitimate grounds, it's Trump freely admitted himself um, that the pretext wasn't really true. It is interesting. Um, I don't know if this is impulsive nature of Trump, but it clearly backfired, right? Because having a special counsel was much worse than what was going on. Yeah, and um, I mean, with with all of the attacks that the president has offered on the judicial system, on the mm-hmm. on judges, um, and certainly on the Justice Department, most recently on his own attorney general, shockingly, yes. um, the one place where everyone who's concerned about that can take comfort and has taken comfort is that this special prosecutor, Bob Mueller, is extremely well respected, extremely independent, and um, is being is trusted to that, that he'll get to the bottom of things and do the right thing, whatever that may be. Um, we talk about you talk about his independence. Wasn't he close to Comey though? He was close to Comey. There's no question about that. Um, and uh, they were sort of famously allied in an effort to um, to keep officials of the Bush administration from um, from from from, from forcing uh, an ailing John Ashcroft in his hospital uh, in a weekend state after surgery in in Washington from uh, authorizing a a surreptitious spying program. Uh, Both Comey and Mueller rushed to Ashcroft's hospital room and sort of intercepted the Bush officials before they could try to pressure Ashcroft to, uh, to sign this reauthorization. And they were both prepared to quit, if need be, to keep that from happening. Um, so they worked together closely. I, I think it was a professional relationship, not a personal relationship. And it's it's hard to imagine, frankly, that somebody, uh, you know, that, that, that people at high levels, respected levels, respected reput- reputations in Washington, the Justice Department, would not have known Comey. 
um, given that he served in so many positions for so long. Good point. Um, before we get into Comey in detail, do you think this Russian scandal uh, is real or, or much ado about nothing? Oh, I think there's real issues. Uh, I don't think there's any question there are real issues. Um, you know, in terms of what the exact what, uh, what the relationships were, um, what uh, Trump's motivations were, um, we do not know yet. Mm-hmm. But but certainly there's there's plenty that begs investigation, where lots of questions haven't been answered, and there's plenty of things that uh, you know are not standard practice. Um, you know, getting word by email. Uh, from an associate that the Russian government wants to, Russian gov- government wants to provide you with with dirt on your opponent, yeah. uh, is not standard practice, and and you know eagerly taking that meeting is not standard practice either, um, despite what the president has had to say about it. So there's 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 all sorts of issues, um, not just uh, whether whether there was collusion, but um, whether there was obstruction, business practices, all kinds of things that beg independent investigation, and that's what the country is getting with Bob Mueller. All right. On on Comey, there was a pretext initially. The Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, uh, and you can talk about this, said that, you know, he did did a number of things that FBI Dr. was not supposed to do, for instance, speaking out right before an election um, uh, on a non-prosecution issue and providing information on that. And, And this Rosenstein character has a reputation of integrity. So how could so how could he have let him say and he knew what Trump's real motivations were that there's something doesn't smell good in that whole thing. Well, I, I think there's good reason to say that, Jim. Um, and it is kind of at odds with his general reputation, which is of being a, a straight, you know, mm-hmm. down the middle of the road um, career prosecutor. Rosenstein's a respected guy. Um, and yet uh, he wrote a letter uh, that, was, that the president used to justify Comey's initially used to justify Comey's res- departure and firing, um, which was all about the Hillary Clinton email investigation and how Comey had mishandled that. And in fact, the substance of what he had to say, uh, there's, there's a lot to it. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which Comey did did outrage in, in a number of ways. Comey Comey did a number of outrageous things, mm-hmm. very unconventional things, and and arguably outrageous things in the Clinton email investigation and how he handled its disclosure and conclusion. Um, But uh, as Trump himself admitted, literally days after, you know, first sort of clinging to this pretext, that's not why he fired Comey. He fired Comey because of the Russia investigation, and he was going to fire him anyway. Uh, So why Rosenstein allowed himself to be used in that way is is a good question, and, and I think that hasn't been answered yet. Um, so tell us some of the big misjudgments that, that, that you uncovered uh, about the uh, in, in the Comey investigation. Well, uh, one of the um, interesting things I came across, we came across, was that uh, the announcement in July when Comey went out by himself um, at the at the conclusion of the Clinton email investigation. Uh, everyone, you know, typically, what's done is the FBI. It completes investigation with collaboration with Justice Department officials, and the FBI um, uh, reaches its recommendation. Um, it makes a formal recommendation to the Justice Department and, and to the Attorney General in the case of a high-profile case, and uh, and then it's announced that uh, the case has been declined. There'll be no charges, perhaps, uh, and that's the end of it. Uh, in this case, um, there was an agreement actually between uh, the Justice Department and the FBI, that this couldn't be handled the right way, this, the same way, the conventional way, mm-hmm. because it was so politically sensitive. There was so much it – was, it was so fraught um, in the context of the uh, political campaigns, which were just heading into their national conventions in July of 2016. And so there was an agreement that they would have to do something different, which was uh, a thought of in, of – the FBI director, Comey, and uh, Attorney General Loretta Lynch actually announcing that the investigation was over, uh, the FBI had recommended no charges, that the Attorney General had accepted the recommendation, and, and both of them together expressing for public, um, for public view uh, the belief that the investigation had been done well and thoroughly and fairly. That was kind of the game plan, uh, to, to do something unconventional in that way. And there were 
active discussions between the um, between the Justice Department and the FBI about doing exactly that. But meanwhile, Comey had privately decided he needed to go out on his own, that he, and the FBI needed to do this completely separately. And so he was having secret meetings with his own confidants for several weeks where he was planning to announce this, uh, the decision not to file charges against, not to bring charges against Hillary Clinton um, single-handedly. And um, this is even before the infamous tarmac episode, which is what many people sort of attribute his decision to act unilaterally to. Mm-hmm. But in fact, he decided to do it well before then, and, and the tarmac episode was really just icing on the cake, as one of Comey's lieutenants later put it. So Comey went out and, and made this announcement without any prior disclosure, actually maybe 30 minutes prior disclosure, uh, at least that he was going to have a press conference to the Justice Department, um, and not only said, we recommend no charges, but then made extensive comments about Hillary Clinton's behavior. And that was highly unconventional. You don't comment about unindicted behavior or conduct. But um, he felt that he needed to do that for uh, the sake of credibility of the FBI. Um, And there are actually people, his top deputies, who felt like they had an obligation to disclose that to American voters so they could factor that into their decision uh, when they went to the ballot booth. Um, which is certainly not the traditional role of the FBI. Yes. It's not, not the role they naturally play. So that was part one uh, of you know, kind of questionable Comey conduct. He reopens the investigation at the end, and um, which obviously had a huge potential and did have an impact on the election, if I look at your numbers that there. But yes. um, talk about uh, that and that, whether whether he purposefully or not sort of misrepresented the whole Wiener's, uh, Wiener's uh, story. Yeah. Anthony Wiener I'm talking about, obviously. Sure, sure. Well, what happened is, the, um, is, is well known. Um, the uh, FBI stumbled. The FBI, the FBI um, investigated the report in a, a London tabloid that Anthony Weiner, the former New York City councilman and, for, excuse me, former congressman and, and uh, one-time mayoral candidate, had been sexting yet again, but in this case with a 15-year-old girl in North Carolina. And the FBI immediately moved to, to subpoena and obtain uh, Weiner's laptop and other devices, uh, got its hand on, on those devices immediately. Um, and this was in uh, late um, September. Um, if I'm remembering this correctly, uh, uh, before the election. And um, they looked at the laptop, began a search for the laptop, and fairly quickly stumbled across the first signs that Anthony Weiner's laptop also contained Hillary Clinton emails. This was, of course, because Weiner was married to Huma Abedin, who was one of Hillary Clinton's closest aides, mm-hmm. and also had access to the, the private server that was under investigation. Um, so it turned out the FBI knew probably a month before, more than a month uh, before the election, that there were signs of Hillary, there, 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 there was Hillary Clinton stuff um, on this laptop, and they didn't know how much or exactly what it was, and they were hamstrung legally um, because they didn't have a separate search warrant to look for Hillary Clinton materials on Weiner's laptop. They just had a uh, search warrant for looking for sex crime related stuff. So the question then is what to do. Um, this the, the, the revelation that they had discovered some Hillary Clinton stuff was passed on to Washington at the highest level and to, and to Comey himself in um, early October. And and yet um, the FBI didn't get a chance, didn't look closely at this material, um, didn't take action aggressively to get to the bottom of it until much later in the month. And Which gets right to the election almost, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly right. And um, in the meantime, so there's a period of about three weeks that were lost when if it, material had been pursued more aggressively and there are different ways in which it could have been potentially, um, you know, it could have been a dead end. It, it, it may not have happened as fast as they wanted, but it presumably could have been done with considerably greater speed. Um, they didn't even notify when they discovered this, you know, Comey and his top lieutenants knew about this, but they did not notify the line prosecutors 
who had worked with them throughout the entire, entire Hillary Clinton email investigation wow. in the case. Um, they didn't give them a heads up. They didn't confer with them or seek their advice, which might have included um, seeking consent from Weiner and from Abedin to look at the laptop right away and to search for Hillary Clinton emails explicitly. So all these weeks passed, and, um, and then finally uh, they discover by proceeding very slowly in the course of a sex crimes investigation, they discover more Hillary Clinton emails and decide then that they've got critical mass to go get a second search warrant. Well, a judge I, I spoke to um, said that they could have, he would have issued a search warrant much earlier if, um, and the first sign of Hillary Clinton emails on Wiener's laptop. Wow. Um, so that was another sort of lost opportunity. And didn't they to represent, have, represent, too, that there were thousands of them on there? Well, ultimately it turned out there were. Uh, oh, there were, okay. There were, but, but he, and he didn't know that initially. But, but, there, but he had, they had enough, according to the judge and according to others, there were different ways that they could have gotten access to the, the whole body of the laptop and uh, to the Wiener stuff on there, uh, the, sorry, the Hillary Clinton stuff on there much earlier than they did. Uh, and if, if that had happened, um, then the whole course of investigation of the laptop and looking for anything that might have changed the, the result of the investigation would have been advanced by several weeks, and it wouldn't have been this last-minute bombshell. And nothing was ultimately found, right, on these on these emails. They never found anything that changed the course of, wow. you know, changed the course of history or changed. Well, it did, it did change the course of history, but it, they yeah. found nothing that changed the result of the investigation. And I think you say uh, in, in the article that um, it may have moved uh, as much as three percent of the vote in the Trump swing states, which is, of course, where he ended up beating, going through the blue wall. Does does any of this change um, Hillary's behavior, or or their um, does it does it does it taint Hillary unfairly? How, what is the net result of the misjudgments cumulatively? The misjudgments by the by, by Comey, Comey, by Comey, Comey yeah. Well, I mean, Hillary Clinton made a lot of mistakes in her campaign, and it was a mistake to have used a private server for her emails. There's no question about it. Yeah. And the FBI folks uh, who are quite defensive about these matters you say, hey, we didn't throw the election to to, to Donald Trump. Um, you know, Hillary, whatever you think happened, uh, it's, it's it's all at her feet because she used a private server in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, how do you how do you said, come out? How do you come out after you've uncovered these misjudgments by Comey, which are, you know, a rather severe nature? But do, on a net basis, do you say, you know, he just, he just screwed up, but you, you don't you know, you're not going to go beyond that. Well, he he has a he had a reputation he, he has had a reputation for a long time as um, you know either the the last honest man in Washington yeah. or someone who views himself as the last honest man in Washington, <laughs> and I think the truth is somewhere in between. I think he has a lot of integrity. Mm-hmm. He's done a lot of courageous things. He has been a great prosecutor in many ways, mm-hmm. but he's also um, you know clearly has a, a yeah. sense of the dramatic moment. Yeah. Uh, you know that he has a sense of what you know what is necessary to preserve the republic uh even if it's well outside the the realm of what's appropriate or or at least you know traditional behavior well, um offended me i'll tell you in part is he made it clear, you made it clear that part of the reason he wanted to get this stuff out was the new york fbi office was so anti-hillary but that that's inside baseball that shouldn't be affecting this kind of behavior, should it? Yeah, no, that's that's true. And and, and by the way, you know, he cast his action in making public. Right. So critical moment is is you know, 15 days before the election, approximately uh, 15. I think it's about 15 days. He, you know, he of course sent a letter to Congress. It was immediately leaked, disclosed, saying, uh, you know, I've come across these these new materials. I haven't looked at them yet. He hadn't gotten a warrant yet to look at them. Um, we don't know what they say, but but he made public that they existed, and uh, you know that was extraordinary in its own right. And he said that he had an obligation to do this, a moral obligation to tell Congress, because he had previously said the investigation was closed. Wow. Well, in, in the last you know, last thirty seconds of this segment, you sure. quote you quote Comey talking to you saying, "Yeah, there is a story here. I'm not willing to reveal it." Do you think he's got any kind of angle that will surprise people? I, I think in this story. There's, there's always an angle that's going to surprise people. You're listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell from our flagship station, WGCH Greenwich, and we're going to pivot to the killer nurse next. (music) 
And we're talking with ProPublica senior reporter Peter Elkind. And now we pivot to pure crime. And um, uh, a fascinating story uh, based on a book, The Death Shift, Nurse Janine Jones and the Texas Baby Murders, Peter's first book. She was known as the Angel of a Death with a Needle. Uh, give us the backstory first before we bring it up to date. Sure. The backstory is that Janine Jones was a nurse in San Antonio, Texas, a pediatric nurse taking care of kids. And she worked in a uh, pediatric intensive care unit at the county hospital in San Antonio. And on her shift, which was a 3 to 11 shift, kids were dying and having sudden emergencies at an unexpected rate. They would be fine on the day shift. They'd be fine on the overnight shift. And when she came on duty, the 3 to 11 shift, kids would get sick unexpectedly and die. And it was happening in crazy numbers. And in, uh, as this pattern emerged, other nurses and doctors began pointing fingers at her explicitly, going to the administration, saying she's doing something to the kids. And the hospital administration and the medical school administration didn't buy it, wouldn't believe it, and ultimately conducted internal investigations where they concluded she was the problem, but sent her off with a good recommendation to get to wash their hands of her. And she then went off a few months later to work in a pediatric clinic, a doctor's office in Kerrville, Texas, in the Hill Country. And in a period of a month, eight kids who walked into the doctor's office with sniffles and colds for routine matters got rushed to the hospital because they stopped breathing after Janine Jones gave them shots of what turned out to be succinylcholine, which was a paralyzing drug. And one of those kids, a little 15-month-old girl named Chelsea McClellan, died. And Jones was convicted of murder for Chelsea McClellan and was investigated very intensively after national headlines were generated about the whole thing for killing 10, 20 unknown number of children in the county hospital. But she was never charged with a murder there and was only charged with injury to a child. So she was convicted on those two cases, um, got a 99-year sentence for the murder, and got a 60-year sentence for injury to a child in the county hospital and um, was locked away in Texas prison, which everybody thought would be where she'd spend the rest of her life. And that's what brings it back up. Uh, Before we get into more detail, the reason it's on the surface now is she was actually coming close to being able to get parole, right? And we're taping this on the day that O.J. Simpson just got parole. Uh, But is is that right, that that, that there's a she could actually uh, was set to potentially be freed? No, that's exactly right. Exactly right. Under a Texas law, which was designed to ease prison overcrowding, a law which has since been changed, after serving only about 34 years as opposed to the 99-year sentence, she was granted so much good time, um, credited with so much time, that she was going to be released and was getting was going to have mandatory release in March of 2018. She would get out and walk free then. And the only way to keep her behind bars was for someone, for a prosecutor, to bring a new murder charge against her in one of these cases that were dated back 30 years. And lo and behold, um, the San Antonio prosecutor, new San Antonio prosecutor, after his predecessors had believed that was impossible, uh, this year in the last few months has brought four new murder charges in deaths of four kids that took place more than 30 years ago. Is there no statute of limitations, by the way? No statute of limitations on murder. On murder. And um, dispel this. Uh, the, the papers have been saying that she may have killed 60 people. Is that a ballpark that's say accurate? I, I don't think it's accurate. I think um, we don't know exactly how many she killed. But there was, there was a... Um, when the San Antonio DA finally found out about this and began investigating, they brought in the Centers for Disease Control, who looked at what happened in the San Antonio Hospital in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit as, a, as if it were an epidemic, as if it were a disease. Mm-hmm. And they isolated all the potential factors and all the nurses. And they came to the conclusion that uh, when she was on duty, kids were 10 times as likely to die. <laughs> when she was on duty, they were 25 times as likely to suffer an emergency. But their best, the best calculation of how many kids, how many excess deaths, as they put it, mm-hmm. there were, is somewhere on the order of 10 to 12. Okay. Um, horrible in its own right, but not 60. Do you, was she competent? Yes. And in fact, that's, that's one of the things that uh, was so stunning to people and wh- why so many in the administration didn't believe it. Uh, to the, you know, it it's not an excuse by any means. They mm-hmm. should have acted in 
much more aggressively. They were enablers, essentially, in, in mm -hmm. what she did, allowing her to go off elsewhere and harm kids. But um, a factor uh, for those who believed in her, and she was a very divisive personality, um, was that she was technically very skilled. She was terrific, for example, at putting IVs into tiny yeah. kids' veins, and that was, that was no small skill. She was also good at uh, being in the middle of a code, because she, and she relished being the center, the center of attention and all the excitement of a medical emergency, and she was, she was very skilled at doing that as well. Um, the 99-year sentence for Chelsea McClellan, was that an unusually long sentence, like they were trying, almost like in the O.J. case where they basically tried to tack on a lot of years because of the prior uh, conviction or the prior um, the murders he got away with? I believe that was the maximum that they could impose at the time because the jury certainly was wanting to see her in prison forever. It's just just amazing. Um, explain how, how exactly uh, was she able to do this? Because obviously there's all kinds of people monitoring these kids, right, and the doctors – uh, et cetera. How, how, was, how did it happen? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, well, for starters, you know, in the pediatric ICU where, where, you know, went undetect, where it, it went undisclosed for so long, it was de detected and suspected, um, the kids are very sick when they come in. Mm -hmm. And kids die there. It happens. Um, most of them don't die, but, but a number of them do. And so it's really easy to tip the balance between life and death with a really sick child, and they're getting all kinds of medications. They have IV lines. They have other um, devices in, the, in their bodies, and, it's, and, and, and there's a lot of access to, to them to give them drugs and give them levels of drugs or shift their respirator tubes and do a, to do a lot of mischief without it really being easily detected. Um, and, and that's what she did. And one of the things she did was she used different drugs. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, it it was wasn't the same drug. Colon, What's that? It wasn't the same drug, in other words. No, exactly right. She used this particular drug in, in Kerrville with all of these kids, and it was actually found in the embalmed body tissue of Chelsea McClellan after she was um, – they actually conducted tests on her, on her after having to dig her up. Wow. Um, they discovered the presence of succinylcholine in her. But, but in the case in San Antonio, uh, one of the drugs she clearly was using was heparin, which is a blood thinner. And uh, there was one child who suffered from bleeding overdoses time and time again. Heparin's a blood thinner and so it causes bleeding. But there's also a medical condition that can cause mm -hmm. unexpected bleeding. And they were trying to figure out what it was, whether it was the, uh, this medical condition, which Janine was using to explain what happened, or whether it was possibly a heparin overdose. And, again, the strange, bizarre thing that happened was that the child would be fine, uh, on the shift before her and the shift after her, would come, and she would come on duty. And this particular child named Rolando Santos um, had bleeding, terrible bleeding, time and again on repeated days uh, when Janine Jones was on duty. And it, in fact, it got to the point where the doctors ordered all the heparin discontinued on the child, and then all the heparin removed from her room, from his room altogether. And yet the bleeding began again. And this kid was about to die, and one particular doctor, an attending doctor, ordered the use of an antidote for heparin called protamine and ordered that to be pushed into the child's body. And first dose didn't do the trick. Second dose suddenly stopped the bleeding. And it was absolute pure proof that this child had gotten an overdose of heparin. So let me ask you this. Um, two things that would seem to be common sense. That, number one, did they track exactly whether medicines were missing or not? And number two, why didn't they say something like, okay, for, for a while, nobody may be with a patient alone. There's got to be two nurses there or a doctor and a nurse or that nothing, you, you could not, or, or did they have that and she was going in surreptitiously? Well, uh, those are good questions. They, they didn't impose the kind of precautions that you would think made sense because they didn't, they were simply not willing, this being the nursing administration particularly, um, but also some of the hospital and medical school higher-ups. Um, but her direct supervisors especially weren't willing to accept the notion that this woman who sobbed over the death of every child, yeah. who professed to care so much, who always had a good story for why a kid got sick and went bad and, and why a child died, they couldn't believe that she could possibly be harming kids. And so they didn't impose any precautions. They didn't impose any safeguards. They didn't do what they should have done. 
Do you think there was a, and then at some point it turned into actual hospital cover-ups? Well, I think it's hard not to view this really as a cover-up by the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, not that they're trying to, uh, they weren't trying to aid and abet murders, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had, you know, reason to suspect, reason to call the authorities, and they failed to do so. Um, and they didn't, they failed to do so it, partly because, you know, they, they they couldn't wrap their minds entirely around it, but but also because they were very concerned about the hospital's reputation. Yeah, yes. And they were in the middle of an image upgrade campaign where they were trying to change the image of the hospital from the old county hospital notion, the charity hospital image, to a new name, Medical Center Hospital, instead of instead of Bear County Hospital. So they were fearful of, of the damage to their reputation, and they were fearful of lawsuits. And she was overtly threatening to sue them if they took any action against her. And they discussed that. Their, their legal counsel actually discussed that with them and warned that if they, if they didn't have absolute proof, they shouldn't take any action. Oh. So even when Jeanine Jones went off to this other town and these emergencies started happening and the doctors in San Antonio heard about it, they, they had an internal meeting at a high level, a pediatric ICU committee meeting, and they said, you know, if, if it contacted about this, we should maintain a, a judicious silence which is really a resonant phrase and really chilling to me. You know, here they knew she was off harming kids elsewhere. They knew everything they knew about what she'd done there and had all those suspicions, and they were instead going to maintain a judicious silence even then. Pretty amazing. Um, we take these four that they've just brought up to try to make sure they prevent parole, like the uh, Joshua Sawyer, 1981, 11-month-old, uh, given too much Dilantan, I guess, which I don't know what that really is. Yeah, so how, it's an anti-seizure medication. Okay, anti-seizure. So how is it that in 2017 they they can come up with a credible indictment like this? Very good question. And, you know, we'll, we'll see whether it stands. Um, it, there's no question it's challenging because back in 1984, when which was literally a year or two after these deaths, um, the DA who had invi- investigated the matter for almost two years, um, didn't feel like he could bring a murder charge then and make yeah. it stick and make it, make it work on appeal, you know, survive appeal. Um, he also reasoned that she'd already been convicted of the 99-year sentence, for, with a 99-year sentence. Right, so it's curdle. overkill, yeah. Yeah, and she's going to spend the rest of her life in prison anyway. Why should we, why should we bother? Uh, so, but, but then if you flash forward, uh, you know, lo these many years later, Records have disappeared. Witnesses are dead. Uh, memories have faded. Um, it, it's really quite extraordinary that they decided to bring this, these cases, not just one, but two and three and four, and they're probably going to bring some more, uh, and to try to try those cases even now. That's and in the case of um, uh, Josh Sawyer, the first case that was brought, uh, there's sort of happenstance that they even had the records. Um, Josh Sawyer's mom, Josh Sawyer is a baby who had died uh, after... Um, suffering severe injuries um, in a, from a fire in the family home. He suffered from smoke inhalation. Uh, but he seemed to be getting better when he uh, died under the care of Janine Jones. Well, it turned out Josh Sawyer's mom um, had uh, – the, the, the records couldn't be recovered from the hospital. The DA's office didn't have them. The hospital had destroyed them. But it turned out that Josh Sawyer's mom had gotten the, her, his entire medical file from the civil attorney's who she had retained initially and had kept them for more than three decades. And so they were able to get the entire medical file for Josh Sawyer from his mom. That isn't the case in the other three episodes. Um, In in those cases, um, there definitely is not a full medical record and key witnesses aren't around anymore, but they're going to try to bring those cases anyway. So the the two-year-old Rosemary um, Vega, which also was 1981, right? Yes. Um, do they have a what, – what's the case that they think they have? They brought murder in all four cases, and they think that they have enough in each one to make it work. Um, part of what is – Will they be separate? They'll be separate criminal trials, yes. Okay, so they're going to keep her busy for a while, even if she, yes, even if she yes. wins them. And, in fact, they've, 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 there's a $1 million bond, appearance bond, in each of the murder cases. And unless she can post that, she will remain in jail – as opposed to state prison, until trial. So their goal, which is to keep her behind bars until she dies, um, you know, they'll, they'll be keeping her behind bars at least until trial. 
You're listening to Forensic Talk. We're talking with Peter Elkind about the death nurse. Now, you've spoken with her, right? And, yes, I have. Um, we've now been, ta- we've been talking uh, completely about what happened, what the events are. Uh, how do we transition to how this, could have, how this woman could have even conceived of doing this? Well, I mean, it's, what's her story? I guess her backstory yeah, before we get yeah. Sure. Well, it's hard to make any sense of somebody harming kids, and um, it's certainly even harder to make sense of a you know someone who's in the profession of caring for them um, harming kids deliberately. But she uh, she's a very interesting back story and life story, um, which was she was a you know she was thoroughly unhappy, uh, raised by a um, kind of a um, kind of a shady character, gambler father, a uh, very colorful character in San Antonio, ran nightclubs um, himself, and sort of you know just just this side of the law. Um, and she clamored for attention from early childhood. Um, she had a brother who blew himself up with a homemade bomb. Uh, she had another brother who died of cancer. Um, she had a pretty you know, went through a lot as a kid. Um, and then as a nurse, at first as a beautician and then a nurse, um, she had this you know, quest for being in the center of attention, for, um, for, 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 uh, for standing out from the crowd. And she did it by being outrageous with her comments and her sexual behavior, uh, an assortment of ways. Um, and then when she became a nurse, it became that she would, want to be in the center of medical emergencies, in the middle of a, a medical emergency. Coming up, our final segment with Peter Elkind. We'll look into more of who Janine Jones was. Stay with us. Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell announcing a new crime show on Mondays at 6 p.m. on 1490 WGCH. All talk and all crime. The nation's biggest murderers were the go-to source for the Moxley murder and the Skakel appeals. Financial crimes on Wall Street. Inside the crimes of Russia's Putin and more. The facts, the forensics, the inside stories. From the host of Business Talk with Jim Campbell, it's Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. All talk and all crime. Mondays at 6 p.m. Right after the Lisa Wexler Show on 1490 WGCH and WGCH.com anywhere. And we're back with Peter Elkind of uh, ProPublica. Um, is she, in your mind, 100% guilty? And um, is she a con artist, a pathologi- uh, pathological liar? Um, how is she able to you know, get away with this for so long and, and so many kids? Mm-hmm. I, I think she is a pathological liar, and I think she's got mental conditions, certainly. Um, she, she has what I, what's been written about in literature and described as Munchausen syndrome by proxy, mm-hmm. in my view, which is that there's a phenomenon where, where people want to be in the middle of a medical procedure. They like the attention of um, being in a hospital emergency room or being in the middle of a code themselves or being, being medical procedures done on them. They're sort of hospital groupies in a, in a weird way. And then a, a variation of that is Munchausen syndrome by proxy where you actually – generate symptoms on your child or in someone you're caring for so that they'll be then the subject of an emergency and you'll be in proximity to that. And that's, that appears to be what was going on with her, this phenomenon of harming kids under her care deliberately so that she could then be the hero to resuscitate them um, and also be in the, in the thick of all this the excitement that clearly something she cared about. Um, okay. So why, so with that going into it, how do we end up with and 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 and, you, and I reading in in, uh, in the book, she definitely you care she cares for these uh, kids. I mean, even when they die, she she holds them and takes them down to the morgue in her arms, not even on a table or anything. So how do we go from wanting to be in the middle of a code and be the hero to being a serial killer? It's of of a piece. Um, I think she yeah. doesn't entirely recognize what she's doing, mm-hmm. um, and I. 
you know, one of the things that was striking about her when I interviewed her, and I interviewed her several times, both before and after her conviction, mm-hmm. is she seemed absolutely persuaded, very convincing, that she had done nothing wrong, that she hadn't harmed any child, that she cared deeply for the children. And um, you know, she, listening to her in isolation was very compelling. Wow. She's extraordinarily persuasive. And, um, but then you think, about, you think about the specific things she said and how the facts are contradicted by not only the statements of other people, but by records and medical tests and everything. So um, she's now been in, in prison for 34 years. She's apparently found God, become very religious. Has she yet confessed to anything? Surprisingly, uh, she has. Uh, and this just turned up recently, um, by accident, actually. I wrote a story about the second new murder indictment, and I posted a mention of it in a Facebook group involving Janine Jones. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got a reply from a nurse in Texas who had then looked up her nursing record and discovered that in 2011, the nursing board finally had re- had revoked her license. That's unbelievable, isn't it? That's unbelievable for starters. <laughs> That's mad yeah. They had suspended initially and then never revoked her license. And then when rumors got out, word got out that she might actually be released on mandatory release, they said, oh, we better, we better clean this up. We better revoke her license for good. So they finally got around to doing that. They wrote, sent her a notice of it in prison, and she wrote back an extraordinary one-page letter. And in it, she says, said she wanted to apologize to the board, to the nurses and representatives for the damage I did be- to all because of my crime. Wow. My only defense was that I was not of sound mind then or any time before 1994. She said that God, in his infinite wisdom, had only granted her a sound mind upon receiving him as Lord of my life. I look back now on what I did and agree with you that it was heinous, that I was heinous. So she basically wrote a confession um, that was buried in the nursing board's files and never disclosed until this nurse first noticed came across the mention of it, and, and then I uh, filed a records request and, and wrote about it. Wow. She's acknowledging a crime and that she was heinous. Well, perhaps she may say, well, I'm not acknowledging that I killed these children. Uh, I'm just acknowledging that I killed another child. Or maybe, or maybe she's going to, uh, could she claim, uh, oh, this ended up happening on my watch. I feel, cul- I, you know, I feel bad about it or something. Well, it, it seems... Impossible. It seems more than that. To, yeah, but. To, to not not to view this as an admission of guilt of some kind, and and to color its view of her, I think it's a significant significant aid to the prosecution. All right. To finish this up, um, um, and it's an amazing story. What hap- What do you think happens next? Uh, the big question is now in her court. Will she plead guilty um, because she was not of right mind, as she put it, because yeah. she committed heinous acts? Or will she insist, as she always had before then, of her innocence, which she professed both before she was convicted and after she was convicted? Will you speak with her again? And do you think, by the way, that um, that she that insanity might work? No, I don't think insanity will work because it, it didn't work okay. then. They entertained that idea. It's very tough to make stick in Texas. So I think it's unlikely that she would try that defense or would succeed at it. Okay. Uh, I want to finish up and go back to your, your current job now. You know, I've been told that you cannot understand Donald Trump as a person and as a businessman without seeing his taxes. Um, you're going to be looking into his businesses, et cetera. Do you think that that is a key item and that we'll ever see them? I think it's a valuable item. I don't think it's an essential item. I think it should be disclosed for any president. Mm-hmm. And other presidents had always done it voluntarily. Um, I think it's nonsense to suggest that uh there's nothing to be learned from it or that the public... You don't see it, right, though, right. As, as exposing, say, money laundering or something that will be at the root of uh, when, when, when I was told that it, you can't understand his business until you see them. I, th- I think it would surely provide some additional clues, but I think there's, there's other ways to find out and, and reach conclusions about uh, what to think about his business. Um, do you think... Uh, I interviewed Chris Whipple recently, who has a book out on the White House Chief of Staffs, right? And mm-hmm. he basically says that if you do not have an empowered chief of staff to, to set the priorities and make everything run on time uh, and organize the White House and be able to tell the truth to the president, you cannot have a successful presidency. So you take away all the scandals and everything. Do you think that's a huge issue? Well, I think what's a huge issue is that 
you know, Donald Trump, who – and I'm an ex, I know a lot more about business than I do about yeah. White House staffs. Yeah. Donald Trump, who you know, professed about his expertise as a businessman <laughs> – uh, and how it'd be good to run a country like a business executive yeah. has not made the has not has not understood the difference between being president and being the head of a small private company. And finally, do you buy into any of the psychological issues um, as um, you know making him un, untenable or unqualified, or you're going to stick quick, uh, strictly <laughs> to the business side? Of it? That's that's way out of my level of expertise. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's fair to say he is a president unlike any we've seen before. Okay. How long do you think it's going to take you to get your arms wrapped around the business side of things? Is this something that's going to take a couple of years to the next election, or what do you think? I think it's a it's a continuing work. <laughs> no, no question about it. I mean, his his business affairs are extremely complex. I'm obviously not doing this single-handedly. ProPublica right. has terrific reporters who've been working on this for a long time. Um, I'm going to try to contribute my my part to it, but uh, but it's a very complex tale. Well, I can't think of a better service you could do right now with your with what you bring to the table. Uh, to look into this because there, there, there's a lot of smoke there. I want to thank uh, Peter Elkin. The, uh, if you want to get further into the Janine Jones story, it's the death shift, nurse Janine Jones and the Texas baby murders. It's on Kindle, easily to get through. The Comey articles in ProPublica. Our next show, we're going to have Dean Strang from Making a Murderer. He joins us to talk about the Stephen Avery case in a book he's written on an old mass murder that happened in Wisconsin and Milwaukee, where he's from. It's our third show, in fact, on Making a Murder. been very popular on YouTube, so we hope you'll take a look at that. Thanks, Peter, once again for being with us. We'll see everybody next Monday on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell.